Um, so well, let me start off by making the, uh, the obvious observation that digital is taking over. It is inheriting the earth. Five years ago, this was controversial. Now it is happening. Our friends at eMarketer, Jeff is right here, put together this wonderful chart showing the media consumption habits year by year of folks in the US. And, and basically what you find is if you go by year by year, every other medium other than digital is shrinking in terms of the overall percentage of media consumption, and digital is growing. And the piece of digital that is still growing now is mobile. So that is where the action really is. And then the second thing, when you really look into it, is what you find is that this is a generational shift. Yes, people my age and older have gotten smartphones and are starting to consume more media on it, but it turns out that media habits die hard. I still sit on the couch and turn on the TV and watch generally sports with the sound off, but I do that because that's what I was raised to do. My children watch way more television content than I ever did. In fact, it's horrifying to see how much they consume, but they never watch linear television, ever. It is always what I see when I saw last night when I got home and I was so excited to go say hello to my teenage daughter and how is she doing and she's in bed with her computer and her smartphone. Oh, she's working so hard, it's great. And then I see what's actually on the computer is some season of whatever show she has been binge watching on Netflix, the phone is Instagram, and she's actually doing her homework on paper. So this is the sort of environment that my wife and I are dealing with. We think it's so great that we get our children all these great smart devices, and then this is what happens to them. So this is very much a generational shift. And over the next 10 to 20 years, it seems very unlikely that my daughters and that generation are gonna suddenly develop a desire to go watch linear television. They're probably gonna take their habits with them, and ultimately the big disruption will happen when today's 16 to 24-year-olds are the mass market in 10 years, but it'll happen slowly over time. In advertising, what we see is year by year, digital is growing, everything else is flat or down. Uh, and when you get into digital, what you find is that it has become a duopoly. There's Google, Facebook, and then everybody else. And I was in an advertising conference recently with, with WPP and Martin Sorrell. Pretty much every speaker on the stage, Martin would say, please, Snapchat, tell me that you are the third option so we have some leverage with Google and Facebook. And Snapchat made a compelling case that, in fact, they will be that third option. But everybody is desperate for another big player because it is very much a duopoly. And to really underscore that, some of these numbers came out recently in the United States in the first half of the year. What you found is if you look at the growth of digital on the left year over year, very impressive, 20% growth in advertising spending in, in digital year over year. Google up 23%, huge number on such a big business. Facebook up a staggering 68%. But then when you do the math, everybody else was down 2% in digital. So we are fighting for the crumbs that Facebook and Google send our way. The good news is every year they send more and more our way, so we're very grateful for that. And really, they're becoming the distributors of the age, uh, the Comcast and so forth of the, of the digital age. But they are capturing the lion's share and more. So the big trend that we are now going to increasingly talk about year over year is the, is, is the bell sort of tolling for TV. Um, for the last 20 years, digital disruption has been primarily about print. The next 20 years, and I think it'll take 20 years, it'll be primary about, primarily about television. Some charts on that. T traditional TV, pay TV has passed its peak. We're down from about 86% to 82% in the last few years. Not a big drop, but it is starting to erode while OTT is, is going up. Traditional TV viewership is falling. It's still immense. Somehow, on average, we still manage to watch four hours of television a day, but it is coming down. If it were just the average, and going back to the generational piece, wouldn't be so worrisome. Four hours is plenty. But if you look at what's really happening on an age basis with television, what you find is that people my age and older who grew up watching television, as I said earlier, we still watch TV. We are the nice little green folks up at the top, 50 through 95. We, in fact, watch more TV than we did five years ago, which is what this chart is showing. But every other age group 
especially 18 to 24, the amount of TV they're watching on average is declining every year. 18 to 24 is down 40% in the last five years. So it is a severe decline. And again, one of the questions I'll have for James Murdoch, and we talked about this in preparation earlier, is you know, are your kids gonna be watching your product? And certainly the early indications is, is probably not, at least probably not in the form that we are used to. Meanwhile, at the same time, what we see are all of the big OTT digital networks growing incredibly rapidly. I would argue that these are simply modern TV networks. They're what TV networks would be if you were to design them from the ground up today. And in fact, the linear television concept, while very convenient and useful for 60 to 70 years, is now archaic and not as, as flexible and convenient. And that's why this is happening. People were a few years ago saying, oh yes, but they're just so small, these little networks, who cares about them? It's important to now put in perspective that iTunes and Netflix, two of the biggest, and I would argue that iTunes really is just a modern TV network with a different, um, different consumption habit, now dwarf an average t cable network like AMC. YouTube, again, many years of insults thrown at YouTube for the content they have. YouTube is now bigger than CBS in advertising revenue and still growing incredibly rapidly, now getting into subscriptions, now getting mobile and social, so huge growth there left, whereas CBS is shrinking as its audience ages. Netflix is watched more hours per month than any other network because they are not constrained by 24 hours of programming. They have enough programming to serve our entire household on different screens to watch what we want whenever we want, much more convenient. And so they are soaking up a huge amount of the total viewing time. And really when you get to it, that is why modern TV networks are winning. It's because they're a better product. We can watch what we want to watch, whenever we want to watch it, wherever we want to watch it on any screen. It's much more convenient. Yes, you can do that with some of the solutions the traditional networks have come up with, but there's a lot more friction involved. And as we'll talk about at the end, it turns out that even having a play button um, is, a, is an amount of friction that some have removed and that increases viewing a lot more. So the slightest bit of friction matters and, and ultimately these networks are just much more convenient. So what's gonna happen to television? First thing is TV will not die. So please ignore all predictions that say that. Um, they are exaggerated. Old media don't die. Basically what happens is they get nichified. If you look at what's happened to print and radio, they're still very vibrant. They're not growing anymore, but they've found niches. They will be around for uh, a long time. Second important point about television is that there are three parts to television, and two of them are thriving and will continue to thrive. The first is that modern TV networks are gonna continue to thrive. Netflix, iTunes, and so forth, we are consuming, as I suggested earlier, way more great programming than we ever have before. We're just doing it in different ways. So the modern networks will be in great shape. Second, access providers are in great shape. Every year goes by, we need more bits. Ultimately, the pipe companies are very concerned about just being in the bit delivery business. This is one of the big impetuses for AT&T buying Time Warner. They don't just want to be a pipe. But turns out we need more pipe, and it's an incredible business delivering all this stuff to us. So access providers are in great shape, even if they don't charge for linear television the way they used to. Where the pain will be is in traditional TV networks. Um, and I think they will now go through decades of consolidation and pain. Sounds like bad news? Good news is it's going to take decades. It will be little by little. I was speaking with a source familiar with BuzzFeed's thinking recently, and I asked the source, you know, why raise another $250 million? You already raised 250. What happened? And the source said, well, you know, I read the history and I watched, the, I read that Paramount was the greatest movie studio in the history of the world back in the heyday of the movie studios, then the re recession came along and they went bankrupt because they had all this high fixed cost. Then when we came out, they were the number one again. You know, it's gonna take a long time. It was 12 years ago that everybody predicted newspapers were screwed. Here we are, 12 years later, New York Times print, still coming out every day, doing fine. So these things take a long time to play out. So TV is gonna be a great business for a long time, but it is likely past its peak in terms of networks. And it's not just that modern TV networks are better. Uh, we have also hit this point where we only watch 
18 channels a month in TV households, and we've steadily increased the number of channels that we have, and now finally that's starting to roll over. We, there's just, the, we, the demand does not support all the networks. Then second, there aren't enough shows that are great to watch all, to support all networks. It's actually very hard to make a great television show um, and series. What you look at is that every year more and more start, and then the percentage that get continued to the next year drop, because again, just incredibly hard to make compelling television. And then even sports, which has been the thing that everybody has clung to and said, okay, this is gonna save TV forever. Even sports is now starting to decline. And what, another question for James Murdoch this morning is what's going on with the NFL? Uh, I think an interesting answer there uh, will come. But as I suggested, good news for television, wow, is it a rich business. Uh, it will be many, 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 many years before they get to actual things that hurt to cut. There's a lot uh, left to go. So the TV networks will suffer in style. Um, so let's go to the next big thing, and I'll leave you with that. Um, so, so talk about this. So the first thing is we've talked about a lot of possible next big things in media over the last few years. Smart watches, smart glasses. There was an argument that cars were going to be this great media platform. Um, we now have gone through some experiments, and we know some things. Highly unlikely, it seems, that smart watches or smart glasses are the next big media platform. Smart watches, we have learned through experience now, what people like about them and, and what they're using them for is mainly fitness. And it turns out they're good for telling the time. That is one thing that a lot of Apple Watch devotees will say it's great. Um, but lots of frustration. It doesn't do what I thought it would do. It's expensive and, and so forth. And, and I think the conclusion ultimately is unless there's some way to project it into your brain, we don't actually want a tiny screen for media consumption. Same with the glasses. Snapchat, it's a big improvement over Google's effort here. But that is media construction, not, not actual consumption. So probably not that. The other big one that everybody's talking about now is, is virtual reality and augmented reality. I would say there is definitely promising. They've consumed media in VR and AR. It's cool. It may turn out to just be 3D TV, which is exciting to do once, but not really that necessary. I remember watching a movie in, in uh, VR and thinking, or not VR, but 360, which is a little bit different than that, and thinking, you know, it's kind of cool. We're flying along on the drone, and you can look down, and that's kind of cool, and you can look behind you and see the people there. And, you know, what it turns out is that when you're telling a story, usually the most interesting stuff is in front of you. So when you are watching the really cool thing, and then you turn around, and you see the people behind you also watching the really cool thing, it's like, OK. That was cool once, but I'm getting a headache, and I would not pay an extra $10 for this experience. I'm happy to have it on that. So I would say that it, with the exception of gaming, which is obviously incredibly powerful and training and some of these other things, VR for storytelling is generally overrated. But the real problem is we just don't have a big enough installed base of folks who are willing to slap on the goggles. Um, it will not be until we hit 30 million households, something like that, before it becomes a real mass market. Uh, and that'll be in a few years. So what is the next big thing? Next big thing is social video. Um, if you look at what's happening on Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, Many other platforms, YouTube, although YouTube has been less social, which is why it is growing more slowly than, than some of the other platforms in terms of views, getting more social, which is really going in. Um, this is a new kind of story and a new kind of distribution. And it is a massive opportunity, both for storytellers and media consumers and, and marketers. We learned through our own experiments. We started this about a year and a half ago. And we've had the platform. We had this great web video business. And we thought, oh, that's great. You know, we spent several years figuring out web video, and we started with bad CNBC, and it was terrible, and we finally learned we have to do something different on the web, and we figured it out, and it was growing. It was very vibrant, tens of millions of views a month. We were so excited about that. So Facebook opened up video. We said, ah, oh, it's great. We know how to do this. Upload them, and they'll go bananas on Facebook. And so we put our videos on Facebook, and they completely flopped. And we said, what's going wrong here? And we actually experience them in the feed. And what you see is talking head comes on and this, and it's silent. And why would you listen? Next, and you scroll on. And so what we realized through a lot of experimentation is that these stories are fundamentally different, even than web video. And a few things to, to, to note on that, you have about a second to stop somebody scrolling through their feed. And it has to be an arresting image. Very tough for video producers who are used to having at least a few seconds, maybe even 30 seconds to a minute on TV. But <clears throat> that's all you get. It's got to be good. You got to understand the story without sound. Maybe the sound will help. 
but you, you have to get it without that, and you'd be induced to turn on the sound. It's very intimate and conversational, other differences, and ultimately it's very shareable as well. So you learn all this, you begin to figure it out and how to tell compelling stories, then good things begin to happen because these stories can travel across many social networks, not just Facebook, um, and ultimately the opportunity is massive because the amount of time spent on these networks, especially under young, uh, with young generations, is extraordinary. So we've been doing this about a year and a half now, as I said, up to about 2.5 billion views a month. You can say, oh yeah, well, a lot of those are Facebook views. They're, they're three second views, it's true. But even with 30 second views, it's still an incredibly large number. So this is a, a very compelling new format. Um, and the other good news for storytellers and marketers is it turns out you can do a lot with 30 to 60 seconds. So let me give you some examples of that. So anybody like wine? I drink a little bit of wine. I, do not need a wine cellar for the two to three bottles in my house. But Pete Spandy, our CRO, is actually the wine critic for Food 52 and has described his wine cellars and storage equipment to me. But there is a new wine cellar that we can all get for a mere 55,000. This crew will come to our house um, and here is a video that will show it to us. So, very basic, you're flipping through your Facebook, there it is, very easy to share, tens of millions of views later, wow, you know, this is cool, we're onto something. And um, another example, my kids are totally into food, they love our, our food videos that we're doing, we sent someone to the Minnesota State Fair, you notice in the last one the techniques of speeding everything up, that, that works very well, here's another one that is more of a food. So the question that we get from clients and, and markers when you talk to this is great, yeah, it's fine, cool viral video, you know, everyone likes that, but can you actually, does this actually do anything? Do people see these videos and, and do they work? Um, accidentally, by producing videos like this, we discovered that in fact they do work quite well. And, and the first example of that was we had a video that we did about a, a bakery in Queens that makes a rainbow bagel. Um, it was very, very popular, very widespread, and next thing we know, we hear from the store, they're sending out these pictures saying, oh my goodness, we've been swamped, the demand is, is so much, we have to close for renovations. Um, here's another one. Uh, we just found this cool thing where at a sh in a sugar plantation in Hawaii, they've turned it into this tubing paradise. Uh, we thought it looked very cool, and we made it up, um, made up the video and, and posted it, did very well. We hadn't talked to the company, suddenly somebody called 
Business Insider's switchboard and said, you know, like, I don't know who to talk to, but like, whatever you guys did, keep doing it because reservations are, were booked for six months and, and so forth. And I have to say, it does look pretty cool. Um, I'll give you one more. And I should warn you in advance, I showed this to a small group the other day and there was an arachnophobe and basically freaked out. So if anybody is scared of spiders, uh, take a look down. So this is a, a product that we found that looked very cool. It's called a spider catcher. Um, we weren't in trying to sell any of it. We just thought it made a nice little story. Uh, for those who like spiders and don't want to kill them when they remove them from their houses. So we count, found this cool product and we made a story about it and we posted it and lo and behold, suddenly sales skyrocketed on Amazon. So, so very successful. Um, so these, the answer is these do in fact change behavior and we're now starting to work with Facebook to get a real sense of, of ultimately on a grand scale what they do. So that's the next big thing, but I will leave you with one more. Um, and that is, if you read in the papers every day, or not the papers, the digital every day, um, you learn that there's this big trend happening, which is our, we are losing manufacturing jobs to robots and, and so forth. It's a terrible thing in many ways, although the economy will adapt. Um, so we're constructing these incredible robots, but there is this person who has become a star on YouTube now um, who actually makes her living designing bad robots, robots that suck at the job they are designed to do. Um, so we will end with her. And again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's great to have all of you, and I hope today is very productive. now and I think what I really like about them is just that they're very easy to control. That makes me sound like a terrible person. The reason I started building robots was because I actually wanted to automate some parts of my life. But then I kind of realized that the over-the-top solutions were way more fun to build than the actual useful solutions. So I just kind of went with that. A lot of people think that I'm an engineer, but I'm actually not. And that's actually one of the things that I really want to tell people, that you don't need to be an engineer to be an inventor. My favorite project that I've ever built is probably my latest one, which is an applause machine. It just always makes you feel so appreciated. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody, have a great day.